where I'd like to start is if we look back just at this resume right here, and you look at the resume, in your mind, what do you think about that resume? Pretty impressive, sustained excellence, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I'm gonna tell you right now that there is a way that you can look at that like you're failing. And you say, how does that happen? Well, we're gonna hear from a coach that you hired and she's gonna talk about that. So take a listen to this. How can you ask that question? I think if you are amongst high profile, highly successful coaches like we have her at the University of Florida, in the fishbowl that is the University of Florida, and, and winning the championship is the norm, you can get caught up in that, that anything less isn't good enough. And I think early in my career, I could do that. And when did it shift for you? Like how many years in? About 20 years in. I know that's a really long time, but, but it took a long, long time for me to truly, oh, I could say it, and I could hear other people tell me, but I never really bought it. Your reaction? Well, obviously, as during my tenure as AD, I had to deal with that mindset a lot at a place like Florida. And I felt it was part of my job was to help coaches navigate that. And even now, because I'm, I'm still at Florida in a consulting role, a lot of these coaches that are there I hired. and. You know, you can't let, I just spoke into our men's tennis coach this, this past week, three days ago. Um, we were the defending national champions um, and we lost this year in, in the, fi in the fi Elite Eight. And I just was telling, I said, Brian, you cannot judge the season you had. They were conference champions. They won 23 games in a row. They are defending national champions. If we allow ourselves to judge our worth or, or the total picture based on the outcome of one match, then we're making a mistake. But I also think we have to be intentional about that as leaders, right? Because there are people who are afraid of failing. There are people who internalize failure. And the jobs are tough enough without us trying to, to help them navigate that. So um, I think that's part, of, that's part of my job as athletic director. Well, and I think about that because I think about what you're saying is true. It's the same thing that Billy Donovan told her, but for whatever reason, she couldn't hear him, and she talks about that. After he won the back-to-back -back national championships, and he and I had a conversation, and I, made, I said it, I want so badly to win it, and he said, you think that will change you? It will not. You'll just be working just as hard to get back there. Well, at the end of the day, it's just so hard to win a championship. It's just, it's this fragile. And so, yeah, when you win it, it's awesome. When you don't when you don't win it, it's hard. Um, but again, it never it never changed Billy. It never changed Steve Spurrier. It never it, never, it doesn't change your life. Um, you know, Brett and I joke about this, but we've I've talked to him when it's all said. I have a I have a million rings that I somehow accumulated that I didn't win personally. But as athletic director, they give you a ring when you win a conference or national championship. And at the end of the day, you know, you can't take rings with you, and rings are nice, but it's not end all be all. They're, it's really not, especially since I've stepped down. I've realized that it's it's the people, it's the investment, it's helping coaches navigate. Um, you know fear of failure, those type of things. To me, that's what's most meaningful about my career. Well, and that's where we connected because so many coaches, they called it title town and they would win and then they would go through depression afterwards, which was kind of surprising. Yeah, it is surprising because obviously these coaches work so incredibly hard to achieve this the pinnacle and it wasn't what they thought it would be. And you know, I, you know, we we had to talk through that and obviously they need to enjoy it more It's really hard to get coaches to enjoy things. Sometimes they they're always worried about the next game They're worried about the next season and I do think you know One of the huge motivators for a lot of coaches is a fear of failure and all of us have a little bit of that in us You know, it can't let us dominate our lives or we will be paralyzed But you know, I know I know Billy Donovan and I talked about that a fear of failure and so again I think it's part of our job to recognize that and not just sit here and say, what are you talking about? You won the whole thing. That's stupid. It's, it's real. Um, it kind of leaves them with a hollow feeling, which is something you really wouldn't expect. All right. Obviously, we celebrated that. We had a lot of fun. And Billy was right there. And Urban was right there. And Steve. And I go right down the list. But a little bit of hollowness, you know, a few weeks later, like, I think it should feel different. And that's unfortunate. 
this was something that we covered last conference. This was your license plate and it was just get it done. And you said it was kind of symbolic at the earlier parts of your career that if someone was in front of you, you would run over them to get where you needed to go. And you got a lot of positive reinforcement for that. But you realized, even though you had the positive reinforcement, I need to change. How did that happen? Because I think that's what happens with athletes. They're afraid to evolve from what they're getting praised for. Yeah, when I first got hired at Florida, you know, I, I was on a rocket ship. I kept getting promoted. I kept getting new jobs, new titles, more money. Um, so obviously, like Brett said, I was getting reinforced. And I didn't care anything about the people. I cared about the job. And obviously the job was getting done because I kept getting rewarded. And JGID, just get it done. That's all I cared about. And, um, you know, eventually someone, thankfully, um, changed the trajectory of my career, probably my life, you know, pulled me in and said, you know, Jeremy, you've done a great job at Florida, but until you start figuring out how to treat people better, um, you'll go no further. And it's like a slap in the face. And yet the more I thought about it, I realized how, how, how so right he was. And, you know, and I did change. It took me a little while because sometimes it's hard to change a leopard to change his spots. But, you know, there's two. There's another thing that could happen. I could have said to myself, you know, well, what does he know? Look at my titles, look at my salaries, look at my raises. It's, this is not about people. This is about just getting the job done. And obviously I would I would have been so wrong to do that because this business, any businesses, any you want to be successful team, what have you, you better invest in people. How, how did you figure hear, that out. like, because there's people out there thinking, I have an athlete that needs to hear the truth. What is it that allowed you to hear the truth from him? You know, first of all, I didn't want, you know, first of all, he said, Jeremy, I'm trying to learn how to treat people better. You'll go no further. I said, what are you talking about? Well, people don't like you. You intimidate people. You yell at people. You cuss at people. You've created a toxic environment. Wow. You know, and as you evaluate that, who wants to be that person, right? So first of all, I love, I mean, I love Florida, but you know, mostly as I was driving back after that conversation thing, who wants to be that guy? Um, and so like, can I just say this though, because you had a circle around you that if you didn't want to hear that, you could have found a way to like get the affirmation that you needed to ignore that inconvenient truth. Why do you think you chased it down? Well, I think it was, it was obviously something in me that caused me to self-evaluate and look in the mirror. And I think every successful person, successful leader, successful coach, you know, has to be able to look in the mirror and, and realize what your makeup, who you are, what do you want to be? I didn't want to be that, you know? I had no idea the impact that I was having in the organization, which in itself is a failure. But as I look back at my career now, I can see the change that I made in myself, the positive impact it had on, on, the, on, on, on the organization. So um, it was just a matter of bread. I, I self-evaluated. And why or how I knew to do that, I go back to what I said earlier, I didn't want to be that guy. And if you could live your career backwards, what would you tell the people that experienced you in the front half? I said, I was sorry. You know, people don't have a, you know, this is their job, this is their livelihood, this is their career, this is a place they choose to work and they got, they got to go to work every day in a toxic environment created by me. You know, people ask me all the time, now that it's all said and done, you know, you see, your career's over, you know, what would you change? Would you change this coach or make this decision differently? Obviously there's a decisions you would make differently, um, but you don't get do-overs with decisions. But the fact that my behavior has created a toxic environment, I would change that in a heartbeat. That's the one thing in my career I'd go back and change. The one thing in my career. Yeah, it's beautiful that you're so honest because you did change it. Yeah. And I have great admiration, despite the success, that you could self-reflect. And one other thing that I wanted to talk, touch base with you on, because the outside noise, social media, is dominating younger athletes' minds. And it can, get, it can change who you are. And can you just share that even as the most successful athletic director in your time, that happened to you? Yeah, after Coach Spurrier left, you know, obviously a legend in the football world, I hired a coach that you know, certainly I believed in, I knew personally, had been on our staff, thought it was going to work, and, and incredible criticism. And I had never experienced that in my life. 
when Coach Spurrier was there, we're winning a bunch of games, winning national championships, and now all of a sudden, I'm getting buried with criticism like I never experienced in my life. And um, it was like a whole weight of the world was on my shoulders. And um, I changed. I literally changed. I, I, first of all, I read it all. I read it all. Back then, they didn't have Twitter, but they had internet and they had email, and I read it all. And it just shrunk me, changed who I was as an individual, made me a, using a story we made, had last night, a lesser version of who I was. I wouldn't go out. You know, I'd go to my office and shut the door. I, I'm, a, I'm an outgoing guy. I like people. I just totally, you know, withered. And I just woke up one day and realized I was having zero fun. Um, it's not who I was. And so I stopped reading it. And I stopped reading it from that point forward. And I promise you, at Florida, if we can find a lot of emails and a lot of stuff where Jeremy Foley is being criticized. I don't need to read it to know it was out there when our football team is not winning or I hired a coach that they didn't like or we weren't. You don't have to read it to know. You know your job. And I just think to read that stuff, and unfortunately athletes do, unfortunately coaches do. And it has changed people. Um, and it, that's unfortunate because, like I said, I saw it change me. And I pulled myself out of that. And, you know, bottom line, I got a thick skin and a thick shell. And um, it's part of the gig. And part of my gig was to get criticized sometimes. Okay. Um, I, I could live with that. And um, it didn't kill me. And so I, I never read it ever again. Well, talk about that. Yeah, well, one of our coaches, Urban Meyer, told me about this. You know, it's such a great quote. Um, there's no free rent in your head. And if you think about what that means is that we, our jobs are so busy. We have so much going on. There's so many things we're dealing with. And it's hard enough. That's your job in your head. Your family's in your head. Your kids are in your head. Your, you know, everything in your life's in your head. And now if you introduce something that does, is meaningless in your head, like me reading the Internet or people criticizing me, something else in the head is paying a price for that. There is nothing free up there. So maybe my job suffered, which it did. You know, maybe my personal relationships suffered, which they did. You know, because I'm, let, I'm introducing stuff in my head that doesn't belong there. Okay. And if you allow it in, something's going to pay a price. And I've seen it time and time again. I've seen it with myself personally. I've seen it with coaches on my staff that they read it or they, somebody else read it and they introduce it. And I get, I understand the challenge because it's out there and it's constant. But I'm just you know, advocating um, to, to try to pe tell people that, you know, keep the stuff out of your head that has nothing to do with the job at hand, has nothing to do with your life. Because um, the other part of this conversation is if you read 1,000 comments that said you're the worst person in the world and 1,000 comments that says you're the best, what, what do you just read the good ones? I mean, it, it, don't read them um, because it, there is a price to pay. Bottom line, you read 2,000 messages that you weren't getting better at your job. Didn't get better. You know, if you spend one moment on that, you're not getting better. And, and I get, if I hadn't somehow woke up that day and said, Jeremy, just quit reading it. Just go do your job. Work as hard as you can. You know, you, you, you're, you're pretty good at what you do. You have a great staff around you. You have a great life. You work at the University of Florida. Why introduce this negativity into your life? If I hadn't done that, I don't think, again, I had the career that I had. And that would have been a travesty because it would have been self-inflicted. Mm. Jeremy Foley. Thank you. Thank you.